Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, really excited to have this conversation around the importance of digital branding. Uh, as if there's any other type of branding at this point in our lives. Um, to get started, I'd like to take a, a minute to introduce the, the group, this amazing group that we have together today, and ask them just to tell us a little bit about themselves, uh, a bit about their professional background, and then we'll jump into the conversation around digital branding as it relates specifically to brands and live entertainment, a professional brand as well as a, the artist brand during this uh, discussion. So let's jump right in. I don't want to waste a single minute um, of this conversation. I'm going to welcome Taylor Grego. Uh, Taylor is from C3 Presents. Uh, welcome, Taylor. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi. Um, so I'm Taylor, and I actually started um, interning at C3 when I was at the University of Texas uh, about 10 years ago. Um, I interned with the event production department, and after I graduated, I wasn't really ready to get a real job. Um, so I did some traveling, and then I kind of uh, put music and my career in music um, in, on the back burner. And I ended up doing marketing for um, uh, some tech companies, e-commerce, and then a few years ago, an opportunity came up with House of Blues in Dallas and um, doing marketing for the shows there. So I fought really hard to get the job and I proved myself and um, I actually just got back to Austin and started working for C3 in the concerts division um, at the beginning of this year. So. It's kind of been a full circle year for me, and I'm very happy to be back in Austin and working at C3. Excellent, thanks Taylor for that super concise. I have so many follow-up questions though. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep moving on though. Uh, next up we have um, Yazid, Yazid, I've already butchered it, haven't I? Yaz <laughs> uh, Britt from Rostrum Records. Yaz, welcome to the conversation. Tell us about yourself. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Yazid Britt. Everybody calls me Yaz. Um, I started the industry about 10 years ago, was an intern for the production duo Midi Mafia. Um, I then started working for the management team that was managing a lot of the artists on their uh, label. Um, from there, I was a do-it-all guy. So I started in you know, doing graphics, doing video content, actually directing a lot of their um, promotional content and whatnot. Um, then I started a digital agency, and then we all together started a uh, record label slash branding agency, but we also had our feet in the music library space. So that's music that's in the background of TV shows and sorts of things, so music licensing. Um, from there, you know, had a lot of success with that. Then I went into working for Revolt TV as uh, director of consumer marketing. Um, I got a chance to actually uh, kind of raise my uh, position there as director of content development, as well as in consumer marketing as well. Um, and then recently, just this past summer, I took my talents over to Rostrum Records where I'm now director of creative services and marketing. That's a short version. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's impressive. Uh, I'm like, man, I haven't done anything in my career after listening to you guys talk. Uh, next up, we have the fabulous Carla Brown. Uh, Carla, welcome to the group. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your, your professional path? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I love Music Forward, as you guys know, so thanks for having me once again. Um, I have a uh, MBA uh, with a focus in marketing from Benedictine, of Univer Benedictine University. I'm sorry. Um, after that, uh, I actually have a long history and a legal background and decided that wasn't for me. And I wanted to find ways to incorporate my love and my passion and my history of music and dance and performing. And from there, I kind of started taking matters into my own hands, which is where Support the Dope came along. Um, I was trying to find ways to couple my experience with journalism uh, and marketing and finding ways to help uh, local Chicago artists uh, in their careers. So from that, I started uh, Support the Dope Radio, which is a podcast which gives a platform to local Chicago artists to tell their story in their own words. Um, I've also had a chance to work with PJ Morton um, as a part of the PJ Project. It's kind of a virtual street team for him. Um, and of course, on site with some shows, I'm helping out with merch and 
um, things of that nature. And of course, Chicago local artists, um, I help and support as much as I can. I work as an artist manager for Jeff Gibbs, who's a saxophonist, the leader of the Jeff Gibbs Quartet. Um, I've worked with Christopher Lamarck on his Jay-Z tribute. Um, it was actually called Brooklyn Meet Chicago. Did about nine live shows. Uh, a lot of work with Leroy Hawkins, who plays Kevin Atwater on Chicago PD uh, that comes on NBC. So for people that think he just acts, he actually does a lot of uh, comedy and music and spoken word and things of that nature. So I've worked on shows with him as well. Um, and most recently, uh, Trey Stella, who is a, uh, started out as a, as a background vocalist, but she is her own artist. She's just released her debut album in February, reached number three on the R&B charts on iTunes. So we're excited about that. Um, be sure you guys should check her out. Um, but yeah, any way I can, you know, help out, um, you know, like I said, artist manager, journalist, um, event coordinator, content marketer. Um, and most recently, I started working as a supervising producer for Under Charities, which is a partner with the city of Chicago. And we work to um, get a lot of opportunities for youth and young people who don't have the financial backing to take part in uh, performing arts programs. Um, so that's well, you're quite a renaissance woman, Carla. Little yeah, this, I, little I, that. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a story as I could. <laughs> it was amazing. And yeah, and I certainly want to shout out all the amazing talent in Chicago. Um, yeah. So many really talented young artists working in that city. Okay, cool. And then uh, let's see how I can beat up this name a little bit. We have uh, Stef Stefano, Stefano Raggiani. Rajiani. Nailed it. Okay, perfect. Stefano, tell us about yourself and your career path a little bit, please. Cool. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I have a, a pretty unconventional path to the music industry. Um, I started out as a kid wanting to work in sports, sports marketing. So when I got out of when I got out of college, I was kind of just dead set on that. And through some experience of just talking to people, I realized that a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do in sports was done by something called an advertising agency. So the, the creative side of things. And I, I, I didn't learn in school what an advertising agency was. So I started digging and I ended up getting a job with a small company that was about seven people um, doing college advertising. And that's where I learned the business and worked every role within the within the organization directly under the owner. And from there, kind of got another opportunity to work for a bigger ad agency uh, called Mullen in Boston. And that was where I kind of got put on a, a bigger platform. And at first they put me on a life insurance brand to work on, which wasn't the most exciting thing to do, but it helped me learn the ropes from uh, TV to radio to out of home to social media and really learn about all the different mediums there are to communicate an idea. And from there, uh, I got asked to move out to San Francisco and work in their SF office on the Google account. I also got to work on Adidas when I was there as well. So I kind of got to a little taste of the sports, uh, sports marketing world. And from there, it was kind of like, I think it was around 2012 where a lot of brands were spending less money on TV commercials and more money building in in-house creative departments or working with small, scrappy social media companies. So I made the, the decision to go brand side and I went to a company called Campari America. Um, they own a portfolio of spirit brands and I was actually the first hire they ever made that didn't have their MBA. And they hired me to run their tequila division. So I managed Espolone Tequila and Cabo Tequila and uh, architected a big partnership with Vice. I'm sure you guys are familiar with them now. But um, yeah, it was, it was a really interesting journey. And um, from that, I got asked to move over to New York and open up the uh, creative department at Live Nation within the media and sponsorship division. So from there, that, that leads to my, my current role, which is head of creative at Live Nation Media and Sponsorship. And my role now is really about architecting how brands show up in music culture. So the same way, kind of going full circle to back to advertising agency, we're working directly with brands that partner with Live Nation and helping them show up at a music festival or an artist partnership or doing content um, in a meaningful and authentic way that, that makes sense for those brands to talk to fans and tell them what they're about in a way that makes fans actually give a shit. Excuse my <laughs> language. 
I, I think we're okay. Thank you, uh, Stefano. I, you know, I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, there's nothing like working for a small company or a nonprofit where it's like everybody does a little bit of everything and you've got to really maximize resources to develop yourself professionally. So um, good, good, good to hear. And then last but certainly not least, our, our very own, the lovely Syria Contreras. Uh, welcome, Syria. Please share a little bit about your 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 background professionally, um, particularly prior to joining the Music Forward team. Yeah, thank you. So excited to be on this panel with so many great partners of ours as well. Um, so yeah, looking forward to everything that we're going to dive into. Um, so yeah, my journey was a little unconventional too, kind of like like Steve's. Um, I actually started um, school uh, with the mindset that I wanted to go into fashion. Um, and then once I actually got into the fashion world, I realized I liked the behind the scenes and the, the brand part in the marketing and coming up with all the creative ideas on how to um, put those brands out there and on the map and finding audiences and so I switched over to marketing um, and um, yeah shortly after I got out of school I was recruited uh, by, by Variety magazine um, and it was kind of a sink or swim position um, I was dropped in there right in the middle of award season um, and uh, actually did a lot of great things still super close to a lot of those folks at that time um, that were there with me uh, we launched kind of the first version of the variety.com website together uh, we launched actors on actors a studio a digital series uh, that they have now that's super popular a bunch of other things and then from there I went on to uh, spend a few years at NBC uh, also overseeing kind of uh, digital marketing activations, events. Um, I couldn't get away from events after Variety. We did so many of those there. Um, and also um, all of the, at that time, last call with Carson Daly. So all of the, the bonus content that you would see, um, managed marketing for that and a bunch of other great shows like The Office, <laughs> um, Parks and Rec. Um, a super fun time. And then I ended up at CBS for a number of years, which is where I really credit honing in all of that digital expertise uh, that I've come away with. Um, there, uh, we basically from scratch created uh, with a small team of people, um, all of the, the digital elements that you see now um, for every single show, everything from NCIS, Criminal Minds, to actually launching the, the late show uh, with Stephen Colbert, um, the late, late show with Corden, um, Carpool Karaoke, our team came up with that as well. Um, so a lot of great activations and experiences um, and uh, very much uh, pioneering in, in social. And then also while I was there, a very small team of us helped create CBS All Access. Um, so really got to learn the whole streaming platform side of things and uh, building audiences. But at the same time, um, because I also love music. In my spare time, uh, I would also put on music shows in LA, uh, primarily indie music. Uh, one of them got super popular. There's a documentary out on it now, but um, we became some of the go-to um, bookers and promoters um, around that time. Um, and um, it grew to us putting on South by Southwest showcases, different things like that. Um, and then also I met some uh, other amazing women in Los Angeles and started a rock and roll camp for girls um, in LA that's been around for now 11 years. Um, and we count on the support of folks like Sarah Bareilles and Katy Perry, Jason Mraz and a bunch of others. And it's just a great experience. We get to work with kids. And so um, at Music Forward now, I'm here um, as part of this organization, which kind of marries all of the things that I've done together. So the nonprofit side of things, um, the uh, entertainment side of things, and also music, which I think we're all on here because we love uh, music so much. But yeah, 
a little bit about my journey. And I'm here managing marketing um, and helping to launch some of those new digital activations um, and bringing in new audiences. And it's been an interesting experience to have the whole world go digital at the same time. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's a perfect segue. Thank you, Syria. So glad to have you on our team. And again, I just want to reiterate, like, wow, I've I've done almost nothing compared to the people in this space. It's amazing how, you know, when you're really passionate about something, you find opportunities. And as you all were talking, um, Yaz and Taylor specifically, like I heard Yaz, you saying like, I was the do it all guy. And uh, Taylor, you said, so, like, I really needed to prove myself. I wanted to get that job. And so um, <clears throat> I find these super passionate people in the industry because everybody wants to be part of this industry. And so uh, those that tend to, to find success are typically those that just are willing to be the do it all guy, right? At a certain point and just get it done. So I think we've all had to in the last, it feels like forever, but we were just doing the math today. The last 30, 40 days, right? We've, we've, we've gone to this place of uh, self-isolation and, and shutting down live shows. And so, so many of you on this call, pardon me, <clears throat> work digital branding through live shows and events. And so I'd like to ask, uh, let's, uh, let's start with, um, I think Taylor and Stefano, I think you, you might have an interesting perspective on this. Like what have the major shifts been in your work now that you aren't actually aligning brands with live shows? What, what does it look like? What are you doing in, in this the short-term space that we're sitting in and the role that, that you, um, you own with your companies in C3 and in Live Nation. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't got slower. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, I think everyone, everyone is um, trying to figure it out and it's a day-by-day -day situation. But I think the obvious things um, we're, we're realizing is we're moving towards those streaming platforms. We're seeing the battles happening on Instagram. We're seeing global citizen doing things on YouTube. We're seeing uh, a lot of things happening on Twitch side. Everyone's trying to figure out, you know, where, what's the right platform for them to be on and how we can keep the, the heartbeat and the soul of music alive, because that's the, one of the things that keeps us going every day. And um, from a brand perspective, I think the brands are really trying to figure out how to be part of that. And that's a big part of my role at Live Nation is figuring out what is the authentic place for these brands to kind of help and connect, help these people that are, we're all in our houses, we're all going through the same things. And a lot of those insights help fuel ideas. So we're in the process of kind of working with a lot of those brands right now. And some of it hasn't even come out to the world yet, but um, just kind of behind the curtain we're we're working through it all right now. I'm not sure, Taylor, if you have any other insight you want to bring. Um, I mean, yeah, pretty similar. I'd say, obviously, you know, C3 is a division of Live Nation, and Live Nation has had a huge effort with um, Live From Home to make sure that they're connecting people to their favorite artists. And I know in Austin, you know, I think a lot of cities have a lot of pride in their local music community and culture. And um, in Austin here, we're really trying to make sure that we're representing a lot of the local artists that are DJs that are doing streams and um, even a lot of, like, artists that we know or that work for C3 are doing a lot of live streams to support um, local causes or local businesses. And so just making sure that in this time that everyone's at home and that they're connected to the artists that they love and helping facilitate where to find those artists and, and how to listen to them. Is any part of the role there then in, in supporting the brand and identifying a shift in tone? Uh, you know, obviously, because of what's happening in our culture and we're we're looking at we're all in it together right and so is there any conversation from the from your end of guiding a brand to change tone obviously brand consistency is important right i'm sure I'm not teaching you guys anything here but how does it, how does what we're going through in this covid space um affect how a brand communicates to fans and connects with artists I think it's um it's one of those things like even at every human is a brand and we all have different tones depending on what situations that we're in. I think 
you know, we had a uh, Pharrell come on one of our company calls and his advice to the whole division, I thought was really powerful. He said, let's just make sure that whatever we do from here on out, we put kindness and empathy first. And I think if you put that filter against everything that you do for a brand, for yourself, for whatever, we're all going to be in a better place. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. That's a really good perspective. Um, and so let's let's shift it a little bit more into the space of the artist. So Carla and Yaz, I think that this might be a space that you can speak to for us. You know, how do you work with an artist to create? cohesive brand in a digital space. Um, and again, in the space that we're in now, in our COVID space, has your approach in, in supporting the development of the artist brand across platforms shifted in any particular way? Uh, why? Go, go ahead. I'll go second. I'll wait. <laughs> um, from the artist space, it has changed a lot, especially from the new creation of content. Um, as far as like music videos go, because um, that's a big tool that we use to like drive a lot of our, uh, you know, new consumption or even introducing an artist to a new, you know, audience. Um, but, you know, good thing is, is that we have a lot of banked content. And so what has helped us like a lot is actually being able to pull a lot of that content that might be, you know, interesting to you know, to say the artist is fan base because, you know, a lot of times if a, you know, artist has a fan, those people are really into anything and everything that they put forward. Um, definitely on the digital side, as far as like Instagram or Twitter or things like that, you know, going live a lot of times and figuring out who the artist can collaborate with um, and kind of, you know, being able to share experiences with other talent um, helps a lot within this climate. Um, I don't know if you have anything else that you were thinking, Carla, but that's pretty much what yeah. we, you know, is a lot of collaborations through like IG Lives, um, YouTube Lives or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, definitely the collaborations on, you know, IG uh, Live have been really important and it kind of what I've seen um, from a place of kind of kind of what, what Stefano was saying about Pharrell. It comes from a place of love. There's that competition and there's that battle, um, as we've been seeing, especially like with the versus battles, like with Teddy Riley and Babyface that shut down the internet. Um, but people aren't really, it's, it's a battle, but it's a fun battle. And but I Carla, who won? Fun. Who won? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to? Um, <laughs> no, you don't. I'm going to go with Babyface, for the record. I'm going to go with Babyface, yeah. but I love Teddy Riley. Um, I think he's, he's dope as well. They're both legends. Um, but for that night, for the songs they play, I'm going to go with Babyface. Six. Um, <laughs> but one thing um, one of my artists is doing, uh, he actually has been collaborating a lot at home and uh, with uh, other artists and producers at home and putting together uh, a mixtape. And it's going to be released, you know, on SoundCloud, just, you know, for the fun of it. So it's no major, you know, marketing push behind it. It's just doing things for the love of doing you know, the music and collaborating and coming up with things together and, and putting it out for public consumption just so that they have something to do when they're at home. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for that, guys. And so, uh, Syria, I'm going to ask you, and I know, I know that you've been spending a lot of time considering this, but where, what are the platforms that, um, or what are the considerations in choosing platforms? That might be a better way to to phrase this. And I'll start with Syria, but I'd be interested to hear from the group. Like, what is that process of identifying um, the the appropriate platforms for a, a, any particular brand strategy that you're you're going to put out there to to this captive group that you have right now that is getting so much content, right? So Syria, why don't you why don't you kick us off and talk about a little of your process in this space? Yeah, um, a really good question. I think it's a question that all of us collectively are asking ourselves continuously at this time, right? We have the world is our oyster for for better or worse at this moment. Um, so I think platform wise, when uh, whether it's your personal brand or a an organization or a corporation, I think. Um, 
start with low hanging fruit, figure out where you have the most followers, where, um, what your target demographics are. So like, you know, age wise, um, and, uh, don't overcomplicate it. Definitely is like make it as easy as possible for yourself initially um, to start to build those numbers, build on what you have. Um, so uh, say Instagram is super popular, right? But that may not make sense for um, a brand whose uh, target audience is, is an older demo, potentially. Um, so you really do have to think about that. Also, are you looking for, um, is it a B2B brand uh, where you're looking for professionals, then you would go maybe to LinkedIn. Um, but if you're an artist starting out, I think have a presence everywhere because that's going to give you also um, SEO and search engine results. So when people Google you um, as well, um, it helps to have, uh, you know, the Instagrams, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, your own personal websites, because it'll push you up. Uh, but uh, I think the biggest platforms that everybody's taking the most advantage of right now are for sure Instagram, YouTube, um, everybody's live streaming. Um, also, TikTok is definitely popular. Um, uh, you just find different um, parts of your brand to share on each of those, right? You don't have to necessarily share the same content on every single um, uh, platform. And that's something that we collectively at Music Forward are trying to also figure out what we share where also currently. Um, but I think that that's probably the best piece of advice um, without drilling down more into like analytics and seeing like who is actually engaging with your content and where they're coming from, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, if you're an artist or um, uh, just someone uh, trying to get a job too, right? Make sure you have um, LinkedIn, all the basics, maybe your own website. Uh, if you're an artist, definitely try to get some music placed on a Spotify, iTunes. Make it as easy as possible for people to find you. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, start where you have the most following and also where it's most natural for you to share content too, because it should remain a little authentic with your brand for sure. Right. What about Twitch? Anybody, I keep, Twitch keeps popping up like there's an opportunity in this space right, for, for a bit more engagement with the fans. So it's driving content, driving brand, <clears throat> but also a consideration around what is the level of engagement that you want to have with the audience that does that play into it or when does that play into it from a brand side from from um, the individual or the artist side anybody have thoughts on that yeah i i guess i can start it and then someone else can take it too if you guys have more experience with it but we saw twitch can be really great and successful we saw willie nelson did his uh big um concert there early on into us uh staying at home i think one of the benefits um also especially for artists if you're using a platform like twitch is um, something that, again, we've also been looking into is simulcasting, right? But even more than that is um, artists and professionals and brands, for sure, will continue to keep finding ways to monetize and um, to make money. Um, so I guess that's also a consideration of what platforms you use, depending on um, your own strategy. Do you want to give stuff away? Do you want to also try to um, uh, rally some some funds while you're also performing at the same time? So I think mm -hmm. um, depending on what it is that you're you're trying to do, um, Twitch could be a great great option too. Someone else may have right. any more insights there. Carla, yeah. you raised your hand. Oh, bless you. <laughs> I was, I was a good uh, <laughs> you may go ahead, Carla. You have the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I just wanted to throw in as well, um, because I still am kind of learning about Twitch, and I know a lot of people probably are too. It is a newer platform. And because branding and content management is so important uh, when you are considering what kind of content to share, I mean, how often um, consistency is really important when it comes to what you're putting out there and into a digital space. And if you're learning uh, something like Twitch, um, I would encourage someone to kind of, before you make, kind of make it public, that you have a Twitch platform, get in there and kind of play around with it. Make sure you know how it ticks and talks. Make sure you know, you know, how it relates to what you're trying to share. 
uh, before making it, you know, really public that you have that platform. Uh, first thing that people do when they hear your band's name or your artist's name or whoever is do, you know, a search to try to find you on this platform or that platform. And if they find you on one where you have a name there, but there's nothing there, or the last time you posted something was, you know, six months ago, a year ago, uh, they lose interest in that platform and following you there. So make sure you have um, something, if you have any, any platforms, by the way, that kind of are like that, they're, they're inactive or don't have anything, I would say to take them down. Um, anything that you're learning and it's new, kind of learn it first before you dive in, take a deep dive, you know, and pushing your content out there. Yeah, solid. So, I, I you know, Syria brought up something and, and then you, Carla, followed up with consistency. And I've heard a couple of different um, brand and marketing people have some different um, pieces of advice around what you're putting out there. So for, for larger brands in particular, or larger festivals and events, how what does what does consistency look like across platforms? Is it, you know, I've heard some folks say like you should pretty much be putting the same thing out there regardless of the platform. And then others that say, you know, cater the content to the audience that's going to that platform. So uh, I, I wonder, Taylor, you know, with C3 what does it look like um, to have consistent content? Is it is consistent the same or is it something different? Um, so I definitely think in terms of consistently, consistently keeping up with your all of your platforms is important, but um, we've always operated on the concept that like you need to be putting different content and unique content on to your different platforms that caters to those audiences. Um, as Syria mentioned, you know, like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter all kind of have some different demographics and some different age ranges of people that use those platforms for the most part. Um, and if people follow you on all your different platforms, they don't want to see the same content on each one. You don't just want to copy what you're doing on Twitter and Instagram. Um, they're very different mediums. And I think that they deserve to have unique content, even if you don't have the ability to make a completely new um, piece of art or video or whatever you're sharing, um, find a way to adjust it or make it a little bit more unique or think about the audience and the platform you're sharing with and um, just try and keep it fresh, I think is important always. Right, and so, yeah, for an artist, what, and, and for Rostrum Records, like what is, what is a consistent brand look like for, for for your artists <clears throat> what is the guiding force behind the 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 digital strategy with artists across platforms i mean like like what taylor was saying you know you tailor the no pun intended you tailor the content <laughs> <laughs> to the platform i mean with music videos it's a little bit different you know you try to you know we create you know various particular trailers for instance uh coming soon's out now's you know, generic posts, things like that, um, that of course have to go everywhere, right? You want to get them in as many places as possible so you can build awareness so people know that it's coming. But for instance, like, you know, with IG, like we were saying before, with the collaborations of doing more IG lives with Twitter, you know, that might just be your diary, you know, where you might, you know, put up memes or things that are funny to you, you know, it just depends on the artist, I would say. Um, so yeah, like with, with every artist that we have, you know, we tailor everything around their demographic and their fan base. Um, and that's where we typically start. So I think it varies for every single artist. Um, but again, we do, you know, format our creative and our content to each platform. So whether it's YouTube, whether it's Twitter, whether it's IG, whether it's Snapchat, um, you know, some people still use Snapchat to this day. Um, same thing with TikTok and same thing with Triller. I think um, just to build off what you guys were just saying, whether you're an artist or a brand, it's about creating that world. Like what's your world look like visually? And then think about that world through touch points. So whether it's your fans experiencing your world through Instagram or through TikTok or through you know, the bottom of this cup, like everything, think about every moment someone's gonna come in touch with your brand. How do you, how do you show up? 
So like, I think if you think about it that way, whether you're an artist or brand, it, it kind of helps put things in perspective on how you should be um, putting your brand forward. Absolutely. And so let's talk about, we put the brand forward. Welcome to my world. Um, what are some of the measures around success in the digital space and, and marketing? How, how obviously there's followers, is, um, but what what are the other markers for success when you're creating strategy for brands, for artists, um, and even professionally? You know, what are the markers that you identify for a successful strategy? Carla, you want to start us? Look sure. at you. Okay. <laughs> It worked the first time. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, definitely a, a good indicator if people are engaging on your platforms. Like, uh, is it a two-way conversation between you and your followers? You know, you, you, you never really want to see where it's just a bunch of questions from your followers and you never respond. Um, same thing as you don't want to see a bunch of content that you've posted and there's there's crickets chirping out there and no one has anything to say. Um, and, it, and it's also a good indicator if people are sharing your content. Um, that's kind of like a true mark of really kind of valuing and really having an interest in the things that you're sharing when people want to share them, you know, with their friends or their followers. So are they, you know, sharing the story to their to their Instagram story? Are they, you know, retweeting your content? Um, those are kind of really good basic indicators that you can have um, without even having to have, you know, like apps and things of that nature that kind of give you the more intricate, you know, analytics behind it. Uh, but just off of just common knowledge, you know, beyond number of followers, I would look at engagement and see who's who's actually communicating with you and who's, you know, liking your content enough to share it. Anyone else want to talk about how you measure success in a in a campaign or a strategy? Um, Syria, you got one some for us? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think. Um, uh, our audience obviously we have artists and then we have brands right on uh, watching so it, it's a little different for both um i think um uh exactly kind of what carla was alluding to it's that conversion uh right so whether people are either clicking through um those ctas that you put out there so like us you know promoting this panel did people sign up for it and are they watching so kind of following that journey um from the moment it's we might have a thousand likes on it maybe that converts over to a hundred signups and then actually 50 people you know showing up so what is that uh, beginning number and that end number so you can figure out where to optimize that's where you pull in like the steves with the creative uh, assets and what do we optimize during that journey um, and then for artists um, I think a lot unfortunately does weigh on things like um, follower numbers numbers of downloads or streams things like that what if they want to get signed by a label or if they want to get a distribution deal, those are the things that um, those folks are paying attention to. So I think you, um, every, every brand or every artist has an end goal in mind or several, right? So for a brand, it may be acquiring sponsorships. For an artist, it could be that as well, but also getting signed as an artist or getting distribution. So you kind of have to think about um, it a little bit backwards from what are those folks also going to look for um, so that you can have those strong numbers in the areas that, that they are seeking. Mm -hmm. So thinking about some of our, our listeners today as they're emerging artists, they're, they're entry-level professionals, students that are just looking to enter the space and create a brand, whether it be personal or artistic brand, and so maybe they don't they don't have a lot of um, experience. They don't have you know necessarily a, a well developed story. What are some starting places for those artists or for those young professionals to step into this branded space in, in a thoughtful way that doesn't make you either ten years down the road say like and oh, I never said that and like screenshot yes you did. Um, or, you know, so how, do, what are some of the advice that for those or even emerging brands, you know, you, you, you pick up a, a client that is, um, a, a startup, what are some of the, and are there some like tried and true, this is 
entering the space, these are some of the considerations that need to be um, considered. And when you're building lineup and you've got headliners and those smaller artists, like how do you bring some, some messaging that allows them to come out of the gates with some modicum of uh, anticipated success? Steven, Stefano, you wanna, I haven't heard you in a minute. Tell me what you think. I think it, it really goes down, whether the, it's an artist that's just starting out or you know they've been around for a while, it goes down to the, the branding basics. So it's like, you know, who are you? Who, who's gonna listen to you? What do you, what do you care about? What's your purpose? Why, are, like, why do you exist? And boil it down and have a POV. So whether you know, it's my first day as an artist, like I'm gonna, I should have a POV. If you don't have a POV, then I don't really know what, why you're doing anything right now. Then there's probably a, not, the, not the best intention. So boil it down to like, what do you care about? Why do you exist? And how do you articulate that to the world? Then from there, you can kind of start to paint a picture of that world. Now, when I, when I have uh, someone that's being introduced to my brand for the first time, how do I want them to feel when they look at me, when they look at my brand, when they see my brand, when they hear my brand, when they touch my brand? What are the, what's the emotion I want to evoke in from that audience and have that tie back to my purpose and my existence. And then I think you, you could, you could start right now. You don't need to be around for 20 years to have a POV. Right. Think, and being authentic, right? Yes. What do you think? Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I mean, it comes down to you being authentic to yourself just to like sum it all up. Right. But like, there also needs to be research done. So like, just like how you were saying, you know, people need to figure out who, what their point of view is. Some people might not even know what that is, right? And so it's like, how do you find that out? You can look at somebody else that's doing something. And I'm speaking more so from an artist perspective. And this could go, you know, with just a regular brand as well. But, you know, look to see what other artists are doing that might be somewhat similar to what you aspire to be or, you know, who you follow yourself and kind of see what they are doing as well and kind of, you know, figure out again, like what your interests are, um, you know, who you are as a person, but use that as a way to kind of help navigate, right? So like, even with us as professionals, people always say, get a mentor, somebody that, you know, looks that you look up to, to, you know, figure out what it is that you want to do. It's the same exact thing for an artist. It's like, who would you look up to in this current, in this current space that you can then, you know, kind of mirror yourself after until you figure out your own voice and who you are as an artist. Right, so your own voice equal to POV equal to point of view. Um, it, yeah, definitely. And sometimes it's, it's also good to sort of identify like, I don't know what I like, but I know what I don't like, right? Sometimes it's easier to identify that before you, you try to hone in on your own authentic, authenticity there. Anybody else have uh, something they want to add to that point? I thought I saw some some movement there. Okay, well, I'm going to take a question from um, one of our, our follow, followers, attendees, listeners. Um, Naomi, um, who actually was an intern with Music Forward, is on the, the call today. Hey, girl, how are you? Um, she wants to know, uh, she asked this question to Syria, but I, I feel that this is something that we could certainly hear from this group in general. Um, what is the best advice for continuing to maintain a work-life balance and, and continue to do your work, but also have the ability to, to follow some of those passion projects? I feel like maybe, Syria, your work allows you to combine some of those things, but again, it's a competitive space. It's a fast-paced environment that, that we're all working in here. So what does that work-life balance look like and, and how do you prioritize so that you can follow some of your, your sort of hobbies, side project, passions, or artists that maybe you want to give some time and attention to? Um, yeah, that's a really good question, Naomi. I actually get asked that every now and then because people are like, why do you do so much? How do you do so much? Because I do like to, to do a lot um, in my spare time as well. But um, I think um, 
the biggest thing is to to find what you're passionate about, right? And and you only learn that by trying different things. Like most of us wouldn't have ended up in these roles that we're in if we wouldn't have started somewhere. So you kind of have to start somewhere. But um, with the the work life balance, uh, when when you are doing when you're closer to doing what you do love it kind of does bleed over, but it's in a good way. You actually don't feel like, oh, I'm working all day. Uh, like, and it extends into, to, um, you know, your, your off hours from, from a job per, uh, potentially. But the other thing also is surround yourself by uh, people, like-minded people, supportive people. Um, and um, you meet them along your journeys for sure. All the different places you work, you end up acquiring all these different friends and stuff. And then um, they'll help you um, get that work-life balance because they're going to want to go out and do things. Um, and stuff and they'll they'll pull you out of if you get into workaholic mode or whatnot they'll be like let's go check out this concert let's go you know the museum find but finding that time to um making that space in your life whether it's um daily meditation reading a book um going out for a run um find time to stop and check in with yourself also because sometimes we get into that go 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 mode where mm -hmm. we're just running on um you know fumes and, and adrenaline um and we don't even think about like oh a week went by and i haven't really had any downtime um right. so if you can uh, kind of incorporate that practice early on um, of just checking in with yourself. Sometimes it's a hard thing to do when you are just going from one thing to another, especially, you know, in the busy world of music and entertainment. Um, but um, yeah, just making that a practice to stop and, and check in on yourself, but also do things that, that really make you enjoy that time that you're spending on it. So fun. Yeah. yeah. I think working from home it is it's like, uh, I think it was Stefano, you said like still busy as heck, right? So working from home actually, I think makes it slightly more difficult to find a, a work-life balance because we're not, we're not stepping out to go to shows or uh, do networking outside of our homes. We're, we're sort of trapped in this space and uh, I'll speak for myself. I find sometimes my work is a, a distraction, right? So I, I'm, if I'm staying busy, I'm, maybe I'm not focusing on some of the things that might be stressors for me. So how, how are you managing the rest of the panel, particularly in this forced work from home space and finding the balance, like shut it off, let it go for a few hours and, and, and do you from home uh, practicing social distancing? I'll say um, for me that, um, one thing that I do, like no matter whether we're staying at home or we're at the office, there's always a certain time of day where I turn off my notifications. Um, so I'm not getting alerted every time I get an email or a Slack message. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't go check my email at a certain point of the night um, to make sure that everything's going okay. But I think if you remove some of those mental triggers at a certain point in your day, it'll help you relax and focus on the things that are important in that balance um, that you're doing for yourself. Um, and then I will say, while being at home, I make sure that I get out and take a walk with my dog every day it's like the thing i look forward to getting outside especially being in an apartment um so i think definitely getting vitamin d and exercising no matter what kind of exercise you do um is always helpful to get those endorphins going and make sure you can try and stay in a good healthy space yeah totally thank you for that so i have another question taking a, a pretty hard left turn here from the last question but want to make sure that we, we get everybody a chance to, to chime in here. So Austin is asking us, um, and I think, well, I think there's a, several of you that, that could speak to this. So he's asking, what stage in the branding process should partnerships become a central focus? And what is the best strategy for choosing brands to collaborate with? I'm going, okay, I'm like the teacher. If, if I don't see a hand raised, I'm going to call on somebody. So I'm going to ask you first, Yaz, at what stage in the branding process should partnership become a central focus? Um, 
Well, for an artist, I'm, I honestly think that you should have numbers um, and some sort of success before even reaching out to a brand. Um, it's Yeah, it's kind of hard because some artists, you know, are so talented that they get, you know, brand sponsorships right away. Um, but, you know, typically, even when I was at Revolt and we did a lot of partnerships with artists, um, we typically like to see some sort of success before we just jump onto it. Um, and so I would say, you know, as you're gearing up, like say you have your first project ready to go, you know, um, your creative is pretty much set. You're in a place where you're ready to release. You know, you have a team in place around you and you have a publicist who's ready to work your project. I think at that point, you know, maybe to even start the initial reach out to some sort of brand to kind of help get behind your messaging, um, you know, that fits whatever it is that you're trying to uh, put out there as well as it fitting their brand as well. I think it's okay, but I, it is a case by case basis with every artist. I can't just say, you know, this exact process you're When ready. this happens, this, this is when this plugs in. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't really work like that. And I'm sitting here trying to like develop this, you know, answer, but, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it varies per artist, you know, within that process. And, and th the other part of this question is like choosing brands. Like uh, I'd be curious to know, I think again, Carla, you could probably speak to this, uh, St <laughs> Stefano, certainly. Um, and obviously there's, there's monetization to this, but beyond the dollars, right? Like what are the driving forces behind brands for the right types of clients and opportunities? Uh, you definitely want to be mindful with uh, the type of brand you go with because you want someone that actually kind of follows the same values that you have or the same interests that you have. Um, it doesn't make sense for you to get someone who's the exact polar opposite. Um, it only works against you because now you have two completely separate um, audiences bases you know that each of you have that don't have a way to um, become one because you're you're too different so you want to look for things that you know you guys share you know a common interest or a common you know a cause or uh, an important value that's important to the both of you uh, to find ways to make that work and introduce yourselves to each other's you know uh, following yeah I think <laughs> what what Yaz said before about staying authentic translates over to sponsorship so like in the early stage of your career, it's helpful to write, you know, what are the things I care about? What do I think is whack? Keep that list as your Bible because later on, there's gonna be some brand that you might think is whack, throw you a bunch of money and you're gonna have to make the decision on like, do I wanna take the cash or am I gonna stick to my values? And if you don't have those values written in stone, then you're gonna be in an interesting situation. So it's important to just always go back to what you believe right. in. And the audience feels it, right? Like, what's that about when, when you see certain alignments happening? So we're, believe it or not, we're getting close to the end of our time already. So I want to get a, one more question in and then leave a little bit of time for final pieces of advice here. So I think a couple of our panelists mentioned that they did internships um, as part of their, their journey. And so Shelby wants to know, what was the balance of doing what you were asked and doing more than what was asked to prove yourself and hoping to get that, that job afterward? So how were you able to identify like, yeah, I can just come and do the, the task and that, or I'm going to take this to the next level. Or I'm going to bring an idea. How did you go about um, creating that balance so that it doesn't come across as too thirsty or too 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 heavy of a lift from from the uh, the employer side to deal with the super ambitious intern that has great ideas and wants to take on projects. Uh, Any advice on that? I mean, luckily enough, I didn't really have that issue, and I was the over ambitious intern that had to do everything. It was I was when I was in college. I knew I wanted to do music, but I didn't have any background in it, right? And so I was an architecture major. And I was good with graphics, I was good with details. 
to like a T, you know, everything had to be a certain way. And so when I moved to LA and I was interning for Midi Mafia, I was actually out here for production and engineering, like interning for that. And then I ended up more so on the marketing management, project management side and a and side because I paid attention to the details. And then also too, is like if they had someone that needed graphics, I would say, oh, I know how to do that. If they had somebody that they needed to do a video for, I'd say, oh, I know how to do that. And so it actually, it actually worked in my um, situation that I was able to put my hands in so many places to show how valuable I was, but also too, is I was pursuing exactly what I wanted to do. And so I think that when you have an internship, I mean, of course you want to get the job after, but I think it's more so about the experience and the information that you're learning. And as long as you have that in your mind, you can get a job anywhere. There's somebody that's going to need something if you at least learn some sort of skill or technique of something that you can contribute to that, to that world. You know, if that company doesn't necessarily value your, you know, overachieving, somebody else will. Yeah, I think that's, that's solid advice. Um, and just that level of social perceptiveness, right? Like what's happening around me and where can I best uh, use my skill sets and my, my own ambitions to, to drive this. So we're, we're at the top of the hour. And so I'd like to end, if I can just keep everybody for a minute longer, a parting piece of advice for anyone that's looking to come in to the industry and, and do the type of work that you're doing. Do you have a couple sentences, do this, never do that, always be this. Um, let's start with Carla, um, our, our, our most polite of, of the panelists today with her hand raised. Uh, Carla, parting piece of advice for, for those that are sitting in on the, the discussion today. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll have real, I'll have three, I'll make it real quick. Um, one, uh, authenticity, which we talked on um, quite a few times today. Uh, consistency, uh, which we also talked on. Uh, but I also wanna stress the importance of building relationships. And building relationships is a huge part as um, my progress in, in my career is getting to know people. And of course, on an authentic level, like not forcing relationships or you know, trying to use people just to get what you want. Find out how you can be of value to other people too and, and build a genuine relationship. Thanks, Carla. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to bring you back for our, our discussion around networking because we didn't even get to that part of the conversation. Taylor, you're, you're parting uh, bits of advice for our young, young professionals and emerging artists on the call. For sure. Um, I think I have two main pieces. One would be um, to always say yes in the sense of being willing to help if someone needs help from you, if someone wants you to do something that's outside of your responsibilities or your wheelhouse, um, just be the yes person um, because that's the person that's going to get the opportunities when it comes because people are going to know that you're the person that's ready to help whoever, whenever. Um, and then also always be pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, um, no matter if you're an artist or in your career, or in your personal life. Uh, I think that's how you're going to grow and you might be scared to do it. But I think for the most part, most of us are surprised by the outcome when we really do push ourselves outside of our limits and see what happens. Absolutely. We're all pushing outside of our limits a little bit in, these, in this current climate. So flexing some muscles. Uh, Syria, a little bit of advice for our, our hopefuls on the, on the discussion. Um, yeah, I know so many, so many pieces of advice we can all give, right? So I think um, one of the ones that has served me well, there's probably three things. Uh, one is um, uh, staying curious, keep learning, um, stay on top of industry trends, what's happening, um, uh, everything changes quickly, especially in the digital um, realm. And so if you're, you're one of those people who's paying attention to what, what is gaining traction or what's up and coming, then you might think of ideas of how that might work for you. Um, the second one is, is be creative, think outside the box. Um, so is you're branding yourself, is you're going back to the, the sponsorships, when do you bring on partners? If you feel maybe you're just starting out and you aren't quite ready to approach a large brand, 
uh, get a few folks together. So organize instead of just you performing on a live stream, add a couple other folks, some who may have um, larger followings, and you guys collectively approach a brand, a few brands to maybe sponsor that um, to at least start the conversation, figure out different ways that you can get in without having to be the just the one uh, that all the weight is on. Um, using your resources, be resourceful. Um, and then lastly is, um, uh, I think, uh, going back to the authenticity and being true to your voice and all of that, but be respectful of others and uh, their time as well. So if you reach out to people, say a mentor, uh, follow up with them, um, definitely keep that appointment. You never know, the world is small, and especially if you're in music or entertainment, you'll probably encounter a lot of those same folks again down the line at different points. Um, so just make sure that you start to build a, a, a reputation as someone who's like a uh, go-getter, yes, but also follows through. Um, I think follow through with what you're doing and who you're reaching out to. Yeah, definitely. And being nice is always a good idea, uh, regardless of how it might leverage. I, I just find that being nice to people is, is a good strategy in general. Uh, Stefano, why don't you give us a little, some pearls? Um, I would I would definitely say number one is in relation to what Carla and Siri had both just said around relationships, but empowering other creators around you. Like think about who your collective is, because I see a lot of young artists trying to do everything themselves and they have really dope people in their network that they're friends with that you guys can come together and make cool shit together. So whether it's an illustrator, you know, a photographer, a videographer, you know, whatever it is, you guys can come together as a collective and make really cool stuff and it doesn't have to all fall on you and you can all achieve your goals together because we're all stronger together. Um, and then my second thing would be to get comfortable with the word no. Um, the word no fuels me. So when people say I can't do something, it makes me even more hungry to do it. So if you can create a good relationship with the word no, I think you'll be set up for success. Says the first guy without an MBA at the marketing firm. <laughs> I don't even know what no means anymore. Uh, yes, why don't you uh, share some, uh, you can close us out with some, some of your advice for, for folks getting started and looking to come into this awesome industry that we're all sitting in. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, I'm kind of going to be regurgitating what everybody else has said, but um, for sure, be a sponge. Learn mm -hmm. And from everyone, everything around you, um, you know, some people aren't necessarily gonna pin where they thought they were gonna where where they started. Um, and so I think if you can learn as much as you can, you might even be overseeing an entire department of people because you know how to co you collectively you know how to talk to every single person within a company. Um, and so you know, just definitely be a sponge. Definitely create goals for yourself you know, small goals to, you know, larger goals. That way you're always, you know, feeling like you're accomplishing something. And if you get stuck on something, you know, go ask for help with someone um, who can then help you kind of push your goal along. Um, and then definitely, you know, genuine relationships. You know, I do a lot of work with my friends. I hire a lot of my friends, you know, but it's just been those friendships that I've had for years and I've seen people grow into whom, I, whom they are, who they are today. Um, and they're handling big artists, big projects as well. So, um, though, but it wouldn't have started without having that genuine relationship and connection from the beginning. Right, and back to Syria's point about get like-minded people around you and, and travel the journey together and support one another. This has been a really wonderful conversation and I, I would love to have another hour at least with with all of you to, to continue this. Um, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing with us and really appreciate the work that you're all doing in the industry and know that as Music Forward looks to usher the next generation of music industry leaders, if these are our mentors, then uh, the, the industry is in really good hands.